circumstances I was told I won't go into, but like I say, they were spooky enough, uh, and I'm putting the emphasis on spook, that uh, I, I have a tendency to believe that indeed there were uh, people in high-level Israeli military that were a bit um, freaked out about our Israeli mistake stuff, and they've done everything they could to derail plans way back when on the theory I might be right. And so we've seen some level of changes once the data has come on out. Okay. Both, both, both in reality and then also on the Internet, the discussion of it causes certain linguistics to alter and so on. Yeah, I, think we, um, I think we discussed that once off the air, too, about that happening. Um, one thing that I did want to mention to the audience is that as you go through the web bot, since we're talking about the reports here, I have made the mistake, and I don't want other people to do it, to think that all the news in the WebBot report is bad. It all depends on how you look at it. For instance, um, Cliff and I were talking once about uh, raising the houses, which are they're actually doing here in Michigan and in uh, Columbus, Ohio now. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, even though you might initially think that it is. Correct, we have Correct. We have to put people back to work. It's a way of, of recycling capital. It's a way of freeing up a locked resource so that it's in a dead mode. We've got to uh, scrounge through all of the um, uh, malinvestment we've made in this past 25 years. You know, in the 90s, the amount of strip mall and mall surface was growing five times the rate of the populace. So now that we've run out of that boom period that was created by the artificial money being pumped in, then we've got five times more malls than we need in this country. And if we're not going to convert them to something else, we're going to have to recycle them. And this is also is in the same way with housing. Right now, if you just took second houses, not primary houses that are unsold or any of that, but just make what are what are classed as vacation homes in the eyes of the IRS, there are four times as many vacant vacation homes as we have homeless families in this country. So all the homeless families in this country could be given a, a home, 100% free and clear, and we would still have three-quarters of the vacation homes out and about. That's how, that's how much overbuilt we are. And that says nothing with the huge amount of overbuilt mega mansions that we won't be able to, well, especially in the, in the coming winter, afford to heat and uh, keep uh, up and running. Wait till you, they start doing this in California. I know of uh, subdivisions in California that are larger than 2,500 units without a single person living in them. They're surrounded by fences and patrolled by security guards to keep things from happening to them. But sooner or later, someone's going to say, you know, even the forty or 50000 a year for a security guard is too much. Let's just knock them down and recover what we can. Yeah, pull the copper out, pull, Correct. Uh, recycle the wood and whatnot, and build something new in its place. Yep. Because you got to figure when, um, if they do... The way I started looking at it is if they do tear down the houses, when people are in a position where they can purchase houses again, somebody's got to build those houses, and the construction industry drives an awful lot of our economy. That was a statement made in 1937 uh, by a famous critic of the Federal Reserve that said that the Federal Reserve will continue to crash our economy until it is possible or until they have the ability to rein in the construction industry. And the, and the guy also made the observation that the last greatest boom would be a construction boom that would lead us all to the pits of hell. And isn't he right? And also, he, the, another thing that they were discussing in the 30s about this construction boom that would be the end of the Kondratov winter was that it would take 60 years to recover from. That's a long time. Well, in a standard course of events, that's the, what a Kondratov winter would get us. Now, what's going to really happen to us, though, I wonder if indeed any of that will happen relative to the global economy if we as a, as a species are driven about by the uh, ferocity of the weather that we're going to be dealing with over these next few years, which might stretch out, say, even to 20 years or many ice age that might go 100 years. So we can imagine that what's going to happen in five years if, this, if we get to a situation where there are big areas of the middle part of the U.S. stretching all the way up into Canada where the snow simply does not melt, even in the middle of what's called summer. I see. I am uh, looking over the questions here that people have submitted. We have one question from uh, Q Tracer. He's in the um, chat area right now, uh, as all of our listeners are attempting to crash the chat. 
tonight. Um, he wants to know what happens to all of our debt when the dollar crashes. It disappears. It's a figment of your imagination as it, as it, as it is in, in any event. It is truly an abstraction that does not exist. The, when the debt disappears, the planet is unchanged. There won't be a single butterfly disturbed or a single leaf on a tree disturbed. Not a single berry will fall from a, a plant or an apple disappear. None of the worms will care, but it'll take a huge load off our backs. But our problem then is where do we go from there? This is why we face a very terrible um, uh, uh, it's a chasm. chasm. It is a, something we have to figure out how to overcome. If we do not prepare ourselves, our civilization will hurl itself into this chasm because it is so used to living in a debt structure that it will do anything, including going to some kind of, of uh, Adolf Hitler, megalomaniac, totalitarian regime in order to get a debt structure reestablished where people feel reasonably comfortable. On the other hand, there are, are alternatives if we're smart about it. But we're right at that point where the alternatives will be coming out of the woods over the next um, couple of years, and we'll have to really grab on them, or we're going to have to go and dig them out. I'm unsure as to how it'll happen. So you think we're, <clears throat> pardon me, so you think we're um, heading towards the uh, Cloward and Piven solution? Um, that is the forecast from every economic writer uh, since uh, the Stalin forced these uh, great thinkers in Russia, uh, Kondratov among them, to do analyses of uh, business cycles and money cycles. I believe we're headed to the solution that comes uh, that basically uh, goes to chaos because we don't have anything in place to to smooth the interactions, and then once the chaos erupts, then the, uh, the control freaks will say, aha, aha, give us all of your liberty and your freedom and let us kill a lot of you, but we'll make the rest of you safe. Okay. I understand that. Now, there are alternatives, and they will not be able to make us safe, nor will they be able to overcome what's going to occur here, because we're at a juxtaposition of not only the Kondratov winter economically, but uh, the beginning of the mother of all winters that might last uh, hundreds of years that will shift our populace the way that uh, the Mongolian hordes were shifted into Europe by the changing weather that they faced. Okay. That brings us up to the next obvious question that I'm sure everybody wants to hear your opinion on now that it has uh, either picked up steam or is petering out depending on how you look at it, and that's the Occupy movement. Uh, the last time we talked was right after the report came out, and we were talking about um, violence and somebody getting decapitated and whatnot, and one of the listeners wanted to know if the violence that occurred out in Oakland yeah, with yeah. the uh, former, I think he was a uh, retired Marine, I'm Marine. not sure. Yeah. Is that, do you think, um, what that report was indicating? And do you think that this Occupy Wall Street movement, do you think these this is going to evolve into some kind of self-organized collective? Or, I mean, what the heck do you think is, was happening with that? Because this is just the strangest darn thing I've ever seen. They're, they're protesting Wall Street, and they got a half million dollars in the bank. I know, but the two are not uh, incongruous at all. They, may have, uh, they seem that way if you've got normalcy bias. But let's go back to the uh, decapitation thing. We've had, uh, it's a wide meme, which I hate to say that. I hate to have to voice that, because it means there will be further incidents of this, right? But uh, the language is about 18% uh, fulfilled overall, and in, we had a first instance of a near capitation of a guy getting his head banged into a, um, a fender by a cop in New York. Now we've had the Marine in Oakland, and yes, indeed, the language around the Marine fit into some big slots there, so it was a key temporal marker in this event. Uh, but again, I think it will continue. I think we're due for more violence. I don't know that the decapitation thing will continue to be focused on um, participants in the uh, uh, Occupy movement. And also, by the way, it's a small hiatus in some areas, but it's a regrouping. Uh, bear in mind that before the revolution, before Valley Forge, was the terrible winter and that, you know, having to struggle for months and months just to survive before they got everything together in order to attack. You, you don't have 
major social upheavals that start and go full steam and until they achieve their goal and shut down that are not organized. So when you see these color revolutions that fire off on a Monday and the guy is deposed by Friday and there's no hiatus in between at all, it's the same level of intensity. That was an organized event. But the real uh, kind of uh, revolutionary fervor takes years. If we look at what happened in the 1700s, we were talking about a span of about 21 years before the United States became a, a country. Yeah. And, and that was, uh, most of that occurred before any fighting. So uh, we're still within that stage. You know, now that in Occupy and um, uh, Oakland has led to the first citywide uh, strike since 1946, we're going to see mass strikes all up and down the West Coast shutting down the shipping uh, to cripple things. We're also going to see, I think, uh, sympathy strikes, according to our data, that will extend to the people that do such things as um, facilitate electronic transfers and this kind of a deal. I mean, there are, people are going to go into a general slowdown for the machine. But we've also got now the violence is coming out. However, we're getting a very stiff resistance in uh, along the West Coast because we've got uh, the Occupy groups are armed. I mean, I wouldn't want to go down and mess with the Occupy people that are in uh, the middle of Olympia. We've got about three to 500 uh, individuals down there uh, at any given time, and uh, they're a pretty raspy lot. And they got guns. Uh, well, it's out, out west here. You've got to make that assumption, yeah. Yeah. You got um that actually, somebody in the uh, chat just asked a question that looks like it's related to it. Do you think that this is the approaching uh, WTF moment that was in the um, yes, previous I report? Yes, I do. Uh, I think we're getting to a, a, a coalescence, a coagulation, uh, as the data usually describes it, uh, of events that will probably hit us on 11, 11, 11, just, just for synchronicity if for no other reason. But I still think the 8th is going to be the key release day. And after that release language, then all of this stuff's going to start uh, coming together in basically a headlong rush into the future. And it is us that control that. We've got to keep that in mind. That's, um, that's, that's spooky stuff there. Um, one, th one thing about the uh, WebBot report, and I think this might, uh, might help us in this, uh, while we're on this train of thought. Does the, does, do the bots themselves, the ones that you send out from all the servers, do they isolate countries or geographical areas so that you can focus the algorithms on any one country, or does it just like see the uh, just a, a, like a, a global consciousness as opposed to a regional con consciousness? Uh, it's divided, you're correct, but it's not geopolitical. It's divided by languages. Uh, so what I do is we actually key on, in on which multi-byte character set you're using uh, within that display in order to figure out what language you're using. Makes sense? There's international standards within the multi-byte character sets that, you know, this character is this or, or this, uh, this number is this character in this language, and when we know what that character is, we can deduce what language it is, and that's how we isolate. So for us, it doesn't matter if you're Russian speaking Russian in Brooklyn or if you're Russian speaking Russian in Kiev. If you get on the Internet and we, the bot happens to catch you, it will isolate you by first by the language before anything else. And then if you happen to mention geographic indicators, it will take that into consideration. But if you're, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, speaking Russian, uh, Paruski uh, uh, speaking in uh, Brooklyn, you may do so, and we may never know that you're in fact in Brooklyn, and it's actually in material. Oh, okay, I understand. Uh, hopefully, the audience understands that, but I under understand where you're going with that. Somebody else asked a question, and I don't have it on the screen, so I'm going to go from memory. Um, we know that you use several servers to send the bots out from. When the bots come back with their information, do are they compared for uh, do they average do they average out uh, when you're creating a report? Do you take uh, everything from across all the servers and then average out the responses that you're getting? Uh, I understand what you're saying. It's much more complex than that. It is a weighted system. 
This is a, uh, a derivation of fuzzy set logic, which mm -hmm. is a derivation of uh, set theory. And what I've done is to add the ability to put in a weighting on the individual elements that can be aggregated within the fuzzy sets themselves. And what I use is Prolog, which is built to do accumulators. So it does do accumulation of weighted sets. It's not quite divided the way you think because we have to divide by languages again. So we're weighted by language, not by any other characteristics. And then as you go further into the detail, we do have weighting on such things as geography and so on, but they are less reliable in our work. Sort of make sense? Yeah, that makes okay. sense. That, okay. uh, that makes sense all over the place. I, I under maybe it's because I'm involved with computers that I understand it. Hopefully, the uh, audience members understand it too. I mean, uh, folks in the audience have obviously been following the webbot for a while, so they have a pretty good working knowledge of it. Um, and, and also, let me let me just address the issue of the servers. Yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, take, uh, take as much time as you want. Yeah, I've got my, my guy there, uh, uh, Igor, and he sits there and he runs these this large server array. And we used to operate off of a bunch of 386 boxes, and we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated. We even have a small Citrix array, a Citrix array for our uh, data storage. And, uh, you know, a few terabytes and stuff, nothing really huge. But we've got uh, seven major gathering uh, machines that are uh, multi-core or multi-processor. And so there, technically, if you wanted to look at it, we might actually be running like 14 or 15 servers that do the input. But they're, they are set out on specific tasks. So, for instance, if we got uh, the same kind of data coming in from uh, several languages that were Eastern European in origin and the same archetype showing up in Malaysian language and then also what little Chinese we could get and then that same archetype showing up in English, then what we do is we take the emotional weighting of the intensity of each of those languages to create our 100%, but recognize the individual weighting by proportion. So we'll always have more English speakers just because we're gathering more English language. But that doesn't mean that the English language is driving the uh, output. Make sense? Yes. Okay. It does. All right. Okay. So uh, let me make sure I'm getting this straight that the majority of the input that you're getting is in English but the rest of the language is also combined to the whole. Correct. And the, English, and the English is only predominant simply because that was the first language of the Internet. Right. That's what a lot of people speak. I mean, it's what's standard yeah, true. in the airline industry. Yeah. Yeah, it, it offers a level of precision. And, and having studied languages for a number of years and various different kinds of language, uh, English is like sort of right in the middle. It offers the, the precision of uh, German almost. It offers the um, expressiveness of French almost, uh, Italian almost, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it really is a good common denominator for all the languages. And, and for us as well, being the language of the technocracy, uh, we had to start with that. But uh, a lot of the uh, curious, I mean, the, if we were to weight things psychically relative to the number of hits per uh, language, which Iger wants to do and does some of that work occasionally, we do find that the Eastern European languages uh, that are based on the Cyrillic alphabet or some variant seem to show a higher degree of psychic uh, input. Why do you think that is? Having a clue. <laughs> Having a clue. I mean, oh, darn. I, I, yeah, I know, national character. I mean, I lived in Germany, and, and the Germans take their national soul from the uh, dark forest, from the black forest, right? right. And, the, and so it is the national character of these people that face these kind of conditions in Eastern Europe and in Northern Russia and so forth to be indwelling, and I think that points to it, uh, that it has something to do with that, that character that, is indwelling. It may be related to the language, but it, itself, the language construct itself may be more conducive to that kind of thinking. I can't make that determination yet. Okay. Good enough. Um, <clears throat> let's switch gears a little bit here because we have a question that came in from Q. Dillon a while ago before we started the show that uh, I'm looking it over and I think it's Oh, it's interesting to me, and it's my show, so I'm going to go ahead and ask the question. <laughs> Sounds um, good. <laughs> Cliff mentions in the Space Goat Fart section of the last report that there will be an increase in secrets revealed among members of the space industry and others. Does he think there will be a sufficient amount of information released as to shift society's view of UFOs, extraterrestrial forces, towards general exception? acceptance and recognition soon. 
Boy, they, there's a lot of ambiguous words in there. Uh, I would agree with the general question that, yes, I think that this is occurring. Soon is a very ambiguous term. You know, to me, it might mean five days, If which, no, it's not going to happen in the next five days. If you're talking soon, months from now, well, there's a real possibility, and we've got something coming up in March where we have a huge peak in uh, building tension that goes into release language, and then that release language goes all the way through the rest of 2012. So I would say that if there ever was a state of um, emotional uh, support for that kind of a view, uh, it would be at that kind of a time frame, not necessarily 2011. But certainly I think we're moving that way. Uh, the problem for us is uh, almost one of mathematics. We have to look at the amount of energy that's been put into uh, ridiculing the whole subject by the powers that be and all of the mind control stuff they've done for 60 plus years uh, against the amount of energy it takes for some individuals to shed their point of view and accept a new reality. And so until we get across that threshold, we're actually fighting the losing battle. Now, I think it has actually turned, and the ridicule side is fighting a losing battle and will not be able to maintain it. But how, if they were to stop their efforts tomorrow, then I would agree that we might see something five or ten days from now. But until they stop the efforts and allow the, um, the media to just come on out and talk about this stuff and so on, it's one of those things that we discussed earlier. It's not on the media, so we're not talking about it. Yeah. I wish that was not the case, but it is. Um, however, however, okay. the, the data has brought up, in, and that's why we keep it and relegate it to the space coat parts area, is because it's under these big areas of unknown. We have a continuing growth pattern that shows that the stresses on our society are so real and so severe that the nasty bastards that have been hiding all of this for, uh, from us for centuries uh, in Rome and in uh, in this country, housed in Maryland somewhere, will be broken into the way that uh, a bear might break into a hive to get at the honey. Now, these people, the, the data has always shown that the, pe the riots are based on economic conditions and people starving and needing food and resources. And it is a side issue that we get uh, these releases of secrets revealed. And we're very close. We've crossed two recent temporal markers I won't go into that suggest that we're within a few months, and then once again, I'm pointing towards March, towards those conditions, because of March would also fit. If the uh, situation progresses as we're thinking it will, then the food shortages of this winter will get quite severe. Uh, millions more will be unemployed. Uh, millions more will be in the situation of being uh, technically homeless or foreclosed on, even though the banks won't be able to force them out because there'll just be too many people. But there will be a huge level of uh, suffering that will lead to a, a great level of discontent that will express itself within this country simultaneously with what's going on in Europe. And again, it all points towards the building tension peaking in March of next year. And that would fit with the weather. That's probably about when the weather will get tolerable to the point where you can get outside and do a little bit of uh, hell raising. Yeah. Yeah, except in the uh, southern states where presumably it'll be a little bit warmer. Uh, again, we don't know. Uh, the, this, the weather pattern is going to be quite severe. If the uh, Gulf of Alaska forces the the jet stream down um, this winter uh, south to about British Columbia level, just north of me, then it means the storms will impact across a much broader area of the west coast, and they will be sweeping as far south as probably Alabama, the way that they hit uh, New England. Boy, I hate not knowing. That uh, just grinds me to we'll no get a better We'll get a better view once we come out with the next report, but that probably won't be until the early part of December. How early, I can't really project yet. Uh, speaking, of, speaking of that, Cliff's website is halfpasthuman.com, and this next report will come out in December, probably late December, early January, you think? No, no, I'm thinking, uh, no, certainly before the 15th of December, but how much before I can't say yet. We've got the servers on, the data's piling up, we've got the processing started, some of my uh, bin buckets are kicking out at the expected rate, so I'll get into my next level of processing at the end of this week and start in on the interpretation shortly thereafter. Okay, good. I'm looking forward to it myself. Um, we have a question from uh, QP4G from Indy. And this question is, um, 
what more can you tell us about the planetary mind blank <laughs> that is going to be and when? This is a family show, so I'm not going to say sure. I understand. Four letter word. Right. What do we? What do you have any more information about that? I read that article. It's on uh, Cliff's website, and it's coming. We're in it right now. Okay. Uh, it's connected, cross connected to the derivatives um, failure uh, globally, and the uh, what everybody's going to perceive of is the uh, Greek referendum um, rejection. Now, here's here's what we are going to have to examine the. Amount of derivatives on this planet are beyond the uh, are the derivatives are a form of debt. They're an abstraction upon an abstraction upon uh, a guesstimate of an idea. So there's nothing really real there, but they are currently driving our system of finance. And we have to understand something: the financial system of this planet has gone rogue. It is now a direct danger, a competitor to the industry on the planet everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, in the in the old days you would put. Uh, money in the stock market, and it would eventually it would actually go to the company you bought the stock from. So if you were buying into a bicycle company, they could you know build more bicycle factories, make more bicycles, and pay you money in a form of a dividend. That has long since uh, been supplanted by a giant speculation system that, as I say, has gone rogue. That rogueness has led it to the state that we're at now, with the occupies, the uncertainty, all of this. It's coming to a head at the moment. We're going to have a huge major bankruptcy, which will include Greece deciding that they're not going to go along with this stuff. They're going to figure out some other solution on their own. But at the same time, the derivatives mess is going to uh, uh, disappear around us. I don't know whether it will implode or explode or melt down, and I, I'm, I don't really want to use all those terms because I'm not sure how it's going to self-destruct, but it is in the process of doing so. When that occurs, the powers that be face a horrific, terrible situation. If they allow that to continue without putting energy into the situation, it will lead directly to mass lynchings of minions and powers that be bankers at all as the system comes unglued. So the powers that be will take the logical step of doing the same kind of stuff that they did in 911, which was to create an illusion that bad guys are somehow attacking us and that we have to don't look at what's going on in the left hand over here as all of your life savings disappear as the dollar dies and all of this other stuff occurs. But look at what's going on in the right hand over here as we tell you to be afraid of what we're holding in this right hand and be prepared to deal with it. And that is this planetary um, uh, illusion game that these guys are playing. Now, uh, Buckminster Four called it a grunch. Okay, a generalized, uh, um, uh, undetected uh, cash heist. And that's what is occurring as well as the meltdown of the system. So they're going to engineer something. Now, getting back to the beginning of the show and the harp discussion, one of the ways you could distract us all would be to have a giant mega earthquake start off at in the middle of the, or at the beginning of a very horrific winter that it causes huge damage to the country and can't be blamed on the meltdown of the financial system. So it would make sense that they would do that. I've been asked, and my feeling is, given the emotional weighting that we've got in our sets, and it's only a guesstimate on my, my part, is that there is about one of three things that spring to mind that would be able to shift the emotional weighting or the emotional energy involved in what's going on in the economic meltdown globally. Bear in mind it is global as the dollar dies. Right. And so what, what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to have a, an earthquake of actual unprecedented never before seen magnitude that causes damage that is so horrific it is the fundamental equivalent of having gone through a world war so that you can start all over and rebuild clean and of course it'll wipe off all the derivatives but no one will care because everybody will be struggling to survive they could do it with an earthquake they could do it with world war three they could do it with a um, uh, space aliens appearing and or space alien invasion, but I don't think they could actually do it with a false flag nuke attack or something along these lines. It, it just would not generate the emotional energy required anymore. And so they're really in a, in a world of hurt, and I don't feel sorry for them, but I do understand their position, and there are two other alternatives. They're just too stupid to figure them out. And if, they, you know, if, if any of these minions ever wanted to contact me, I'd be quite happy to point out to them how they can get out of this uh, fiasco without getting uh, involved and getting lynched. But we're facing that precipice, and it's within months. When we hit this winter, officially it's December, um, the solstice and December 21, mm -hmm. but 
but our our real winter uh the winter of our disconnect uh, and discontent is going to be uh striking everybody in the northern hemisphere probably on november 8th and so um, a mere eight days from now uh we're going to be going into the but in hindsight will be revealed to be the chondrotive winter of the economics and all of this sort of thing. And I think calmness and a lot of pies and naps will help out. But uh, personally, I'm, not, I'm going to try and stay out of it. I'm not going to get involved. I'm going to try and remove my emotions from the situation. Okay. What, what should people look for, for to identify this, this starting so they can say, okay, what Cliff was talking about is starting right now. Let's take some preemptive action. Let's get out of town. Let's uh, 